please welcome Katie Masouris and Chris Weisopel. Good morning, and thank you all so much for joining us on this early morning on the last day of RSA. We are so happy to be here today. Today, we're going to talk to you about coordinated vulnerability disclosure. You've come a long way, baby. But first, we want to get through some vocabulary, because we've seen a lot of words in this space used interchangeably, and it turns out words matter. So before we have this discussion, weaving in some history with some current data about vulnerability disclosure, we really wanted to settle on some terms. So what is vulnerability disclosure in the first place? Well, it's the process by which you receive a vulnerability report from the outside, decide to do something with it or not, and then release guidance or a patch or something. And that process is governed by two ISO standards that Art Bannon from CERT CC and I co-authored and co-edited. Those are ISO 29147 and ISO 30111. Think of 29147 as the mouth and the other end, and 30111 as the digestive system of the bugs. So that's vuln disclosure. Penetration testing, on the other hand, is inviting professional outside hackers to take a look at your security controls, try to find some vulnerabilities, and really ideally tell you how to fix them and prevent them in the future. That's done under contract, under NDA, and it's a profession that Weld Pond, I mean Chris Weisopel and I, both started out in a long time ago at the very beginning of the penetration testing industry about 20 years ago. And finally, we've got bug bounty programs. And a lot of people use them interchangeably with pen testing. And a lot of people try to put non-disclosure agreements on bug bounties, which is a little funny because it's sort of a blend between coordinated vuln disclosure, where people were reporting bugs for free and waiting to get them fixed, and penetration testing, where you get paid for bugs. But even some of the bugs that are deemed out of scope in some of these bug bounty programs are not allowed to be released. So it's a little bit like asking someone to work for the exposure without the exposure. So now that we've got the terms right, we're going to go into some data. So uh, Vericode uh, conducted a study last year on coordinated vulnerability disclosure. We worked with 451 Group to shape the study and actually ex execute the survey with respondents. And we wanted it to be broad enough that we, we weren't just talking to you know, software companies or just talking to researchers. We wanted to talk to people that were in charge of information security at organizations. We wanted to talk to um, professional penetration testers and infrastructure security people. So it was fairly broad. It was about 1,000 participants in Europe and in the United States. And there was a requirement that you actually had to have a medium to high awareness of, of vulnerability disclosure policies. You, couldn't, you, you had to have some knowledge about it in order for your opinion to be valid. And on the uh, slide there, you'll see that's actually the link to the full study. But we're going to be picking out some of the interesting uh, data from, from the survey and sharing it with you today. Well, first, let's start with a little history. You know, when Chris asked me to do this talk with him, we were trying to think back of how long we've known each other, and we don't remember. So it's been that long. But since we've been through some of the evolutionary, core evolutionary points, and sometimes driven some of them ourselves, along with our friends and colleagues, we thought we'd give you a little piece of history. Yeah, so some of these um, learning experiences are what drove modern day coordinated vulnerability disclosure. You sort of had to learn along the way. And um, one of those learnings was uh, doing disclosure without coordination. So there was a time before CVD that vulnerability researchers would just publish things to, to uh, mailing lists like BugTrack. I was part of, of the loft back in the 90s, and we did quite a bit of uh, vulnerability research and publishing um, of research. Um, we actually, the only thing in the 90s that really exists, especially in the early, early uh, to mid-90s that existed that even approached coordination was uh, sending an email to CERT and giving them the, the, uh, the vulnerability information and say, can you, can you contact the vendor? And CERT would happily take the vulnerability information and say, yes, we'll contact a vendor. And that was the end of the process. You didn't hear from them again. 
You didn't know if the vulnerability got fixed, what version it got fixed in. You didn't know when you could start talking about it, and maybe it, the bug had already been fixed. It wasn't really coordinated. Um, so we, we tried that a little bit at the loft, and we decided that, you know, that didn't really help the general public understand that their software was vulnerable, that kind of process. So we would just publish the things uh, pu publicly. And uh, so in November 97, uh, Dildog, or also uh, real name Christian Ryu, my co-founder at Ferricode, um, was part of the loft. And he found a particularly interesting remote code execution bug in uh, IE4 where um, he could generate a link put it on a web page, and if someone clicked on that link, you could execute code on their machine. And he published this um, with a proof of concept code so other people could understand it. Um, this was actually kind of a new kind of vulnerability now. We understand these pretty well now. Um, and one of the fun things that he did was he created a proof of concept on the loft.com website. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers back in 97, um, Intel Pentiums had a bug where if you executed the F00F instruction, it locked up the CPU. So we did a really simple proof of concept. We actually called it the foof of concept, because uh, it was F-O-O-F. And uh, you could click on a link on the Veracode page if you're running IE4, and it would lock up your, your whole machine. We put a lot of warnings around that. Mm -hmm. So this kind of got in the press, and people were like, look at this, IE4 is vulnerable. And for the first time, Microsoft actually reached out and sent us an email to our contact address and said, you know what, guys? If you send us the vulnerability information before releasing it to the public, we'll fix it, and we'll get back to you when we fix it, and then you should release the information. And we said, you know, if you're really going to fix it and get back to us and tell you you fixed it and you have no problem with us releasing the information after you've fixed it, then let's try that. Right, let's try that. So that was really kind of the birth of coordinated vulnerability disclosure, at least between the loft and, 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 and Microsoft. And it was also the birth, birth of the first haiku um, published in a vulnerability report, I believe. Dildog wrote, Microsoft IE, is there no security? Not if you ask me. So a little bit of a poet also. <laughs> but then after, after that incident, um, people started to do a little bit of this coordination, but it was very ad hoc. It was kind of like you had to come up with an agreement with each vendor, like what would a vendor accept? And really only Microsoft was one of the only ones sophisticated enough to do this. So Rainforest Puppy, that was his actual hacker name, so everyone called him RFP because that's quite a mouthful, was finding a lot of vulnerabilities and reporting them. And he took it upon himself to say, I want to I wanna have a rules of engagement that I will, when I send a vulnerability to a vendor, what my expectations are. And he codified that up in what he called RF policy. And one of the first things he put in there that was really kind of a breakthrough was, I'm going to give you X number of days to fix it, or I'm going to go ahead and release anyway. I'm not sure how many days, if you remember how many days it was. I think originally it was five, and then he bumped it up to 30. Five is kind of short. We're going to talk about time frames, too. <laughs> um, and then a, a further evolution of that was in 2000, um, I got together uh, Steve Christie, um, who's right the here. father of CWE. I think he might be the grandfather, because CWE has children now. Um, <laughs> he came to me and said, you know, Chris, why don't we actually make a real standard around this? Why don't we submit an RFC to the IETF and, and actually have something that is documented that you can point to, and it's not just something that a security researcher did, a standards body actually accepted it. Well, a couple things happened that it didn't go very well. Um, one thing was the IETF thought this was kind of a hot potato and just didn't want to deal with it. They said, it's not in our purview. Mm -hmm. We don't want to deal with this kind of standard. Um, the second problem was when we released the standard, we called it the responsible disclosure policy. So it, in hindsight, that was a mistake because that word responsible is very loaded. And the fact that it was a modifier in the word disclosure kind of meant that the researcher, if they weren't going to follow this policy, would, could be deemed irresponsible. 
Yeah, unfortunately, it became a tool and a hammer that is still used today to essentially intimidate researchers into doing what the vendor thinks is the right thing. Reasonable people will disagree about the best way to protect users. And sometimes the researchers find that waiting forever is not actually the best way to protect users. So this next story is one uh, where Chris and I had worked on the disclosure of, of an issue that um, I and my boyfriend at the time had found. Um, how many of you have seen this Lexar jump drive thing, right? This is a little USB drive. And at the time, they had a regular jump drive. And then they had one that was branded as secure. And the advertising basically said that if this drive were out of your possession, because you have the capacity to secure a partition of it with a password and it's encrypted, that it's safe even if it gets lost, right? That was their security model which they promptly broke by their implementation. So my boyfriend at the time, Luis Miras, and I took a look at this thing. We attached a debugger to the application that came with the drive that would partition it for you and allow you to set a password. Well, this isn't the real dump of the memory there, but you can imagine the, the application itself did the work for us. All we needed to do was set a password and then come into the application again with the debugger attached. And we could see that the application helpfully decrypted the stored password for us, showed it to us in clear text in memory. So any password attempt with the debugger attached, you'd be able to see the stored password and then just subsequently get in. So obviously, this was a problem. Um, we tried to follow our vulnerability disclosure policy, because at the time, we were both the artists formerly known as at stake, you know, early uh, application security penetration testers. We had a policy for disclosure based largely on RF policy. And so we attempted contact through every means we could. I think we skipped faxing them, but um, we did everything else. We even called them. So we exceeded our own time frame for what we would normally wait, which was 30 days. And we kept giving them you know, chances to just say anything, nothing at all. So we did what we were going to do. And Chris's role in all of this you know, was to help us coordinate this vulnerability and you know, make sure that we were also following the company's policy, which we had set ourselves as researchers. Um, but you know, also to gut check us when it was like, look, these guys haven't even acknowledged our email or phone calls or other emails or other phone calls. So how long are we going to give them? Forever? Probably not. So what we did was we dropped zero day. Right? Um, we did redact some of the details. We didn't release any proof of concept. But we still wanted users to be protected and understand that this thing, it doesn't do what it's the, uh, what it was marketed to do. And we wanted people to understand that if the drive were lost and not outside of their possession, that someone could actually see their encrypted data. Um, so I, I don't speak any other human languages, but as soon as that advisory dropped, oh, we got phone calls. And there were swear words that I had never heard in my entire life. Now, what's funny about this is some of the very same people who were on those email lists we're coming back at us saying, I don't understand how you can call yourselves responsible when you did this. And we thought, well, you could have just answered our email like that. We, we told you what our policy was, and we gave you all this time. But I guess they figured that if they just ignored it, it might go away. Unfortunately, there is a lot of that still going on. But hopefully, some of this data is going to show that things are going to get better. So here's some of the data from the Veracode report they did with 451 Research. And this is sort of, of the respondents, th these are the actions that researchers take now. So what, what's good about it is that the majority of researchers um, actually report vulnerabilities to the affected vendor. They try to do it in a coordinated way, either directly through a coordinator uh, like CERT-CC or through a bug bounty program. But you, know, you can see 9% of them do release the vulnerabilities vulnerability to the public. And for us, that was a last resort, a last, last resort. And hackers still have to do this today. So I mentioned a little bit about the timeline issue that was really introduced in RF policy. And this is probably the thing that is still the most controversial part of any kind of CVD. I think most of the other uh, aspects of CVD, we've learned lessons of the past. 
but the time frame issue still becomes a challenge. And I think it's the biggest reason is there's a vast diversity in technology and capability to fix things. I mean, think of a SaaS company where they control both building the software and deploying the software. And a lot of times, SaaS companies are working with a release schedule that's agile or DevOps, which could be days or weeks. You know, a lot of SaaS companies can fix a, fix a security bug and push it out in a, in a few days, and it's not even that much burden on them. Um, all the way on the other end of the spectrum, you have things that are deployed in hardware, right? Um, where you have, someone might have to actually physically um, go and, and, uh, and uh, use, use arcane processes to, to patch things. And um, they're on systems that don't get updated very often. Maybe they haven't been updated in years. So it's difficult for the vendor to update and go through the testing process. And you could see how that might take a few months to do that, even if you're working hard on it. So we, we asked the survey, we asked our participants um, what, what they thought was a reasonable time frame. And you can see the, the majority are in that sort of 30 to 60 days or less than 30 days. So people think maybe 60 days is, is, is kind of a good um, time frame. Um, but there's 8% that think that we should wait until the vendor fixes it. You should just keep waiting um, un un until that happens. So I, I want to do a couple shows of hands here to see what people think. Um, so my first question is, and if you could raise your hand if you uh, agree, how many think vendors um, should be able to ask the researcher for more time and the researcher respects those requests? How many people think that? So yeah, about a third of the group maybe. Um, and so I have a second question here. How many agree? that um, vendors should be given less than 30 days to fix a vulnerability. 30 days is enough time. Okay, there's two, three, four people in this audience. Uh, maybe said five. That. So yeah, not many people think 30 days is, is reasonable. OK, so how many agree with the tenet that one must never disclose vulnerability details if there's no fix available? Oh, there's a couple of those. OK. All right. Now, raise your hands if you're proud about that. All right. Um, and then how many of you know that even Microsoft has dropped zero day? Really? OK. Oh, there we some go. Some people know. So some people know. So I created Microsoft Vulnerability Research back in 2008 to assist with the multi-party vulnerability coordination of Dan Kaminsky's DNS world-ending internet fire, dumpster fire bug. and. Um, one of the things that was interesting about that process was bringing together different vendors who had to implement a, a change and ideally coordinate their release altogether. So um, in that process, Microsoft was the slow one in that group, and we had to work to persuade the other vendors um, to please hold their patches so that we could get ours ready. But in other cases, certainly, we would see things where we were worried about, we as Microsoft at the time, were worried about about our customer's safety, and especially if we saw evidence of exploitation in the wild of a vulnerability we found using our telemetry, then it was absolutely appropriate for us to release details. There's another case uh, back in 2010 when Active Template Library, which was compiled into every single ActiveX control that was made at the time, had a vulnerability in it. So we could fix the library, but every single ActiveX control that hadn't been recompiled would still be vulnerable. So how to deal with all of those secondary affected vendors? Um, well, we chose the top 10 or 15 vendors with the biggest overlapping customer base to Microsoft to try and protect as many customers as possible. We let them into the multi-party vulnerability disclosure circle, gave them the updated library so that on the day we released it, they could release their updated ActiveX controls at the same time. And trust me, one of those was Facebook, and their affected ActiveX control component uh, was written by some dude in Romania. And I had to call him up on the phone and say, yeah, so there's a problem in the library, and it causes this. And he said, oh, we don't use that library. I was, it was a challenge all around. But that was the order of operations that we did. Though only those vendors of all of the affected vendors got pre-disclosure, and we dropped O'Day on everybody else. Couldn't be helped. So 
Sentiment has changed over the years, right? This is also data from the survey. 90% of respondents, and that's on any side of the vulnerability disclosure equation, actually view vulnerability disclosure as something of a public good. This sentiment has grown over time, and that's a positive thing, right? And then a majority of them, which is interesting, think that you do not need permission to go ahead and test and, and find a vulnerability. Well, that gets interesting because, as you know, there are a lot of laws having to do with hacking, not just the Computer Fraud and Abuse Law, uh, Act in the United States, CFAA, um, or the DMCA, but also there are increasing number of data protection and privacy laws, which gets complicated, right? And you're thinking to yourself, well, can't we just have a bug bounty or a vulnerable disclosure program make them sign NDAs and all this stuff? Well, you know, and avoid a data breach? Um, if they find data or encounter data um, before asking for permission and before asking for authorization, and that turns out to not really work out, right? It's not the equivalent as hiring a penetration testing company, which is then acting as an extension of your own organization. So even if they find all the data that's, you know, protected classes of data, it's still not categorized as a breach. Because ideally, your company in hiring the pen test company has vetted that they have appropriate data segmentation and that they will destroy any data and all that. So when I was the first pen tester of the Gates Foundation and I got Warren Buffett's social security number, if he's watching eventually, um, I don't still have it, okay? Because we got rid of it. Now, what happened recently, in recent history, this is a pictures of me testifying before Congress in the Uber data breach case that their bug bounty program paid $100,000 to extortionists and made them sign an NDA to say they were going to delete the 57 million records they had downloaded and tell no one of what had happened. Now, Congress was obviously interested in Uber's handling of this because Uber had already been in trouble with the FTC for a different data breach. And so th they were in trouble. And what was interesting about it was the researchers themselves, you know, they thought, well, we complied with the NDA, we got our money through this bug bounty program, and they tried the same thing on another company. They were promptly indicted. So, it goes to show that things right now are complicated. Asking for permission ahead of time is still the safest thing. But the survey respondents you know, certainly thought that uh, a lot more could be done without asking for permission. Well, OK, so what happens when CVD goes mainstream, which is kind of where we are today? Ideally, you've got a bunch of friendly folks coming and reporting vulnerabilities to you. What could possibly go wrong? Well, remember I said that digestive system of bugs is pretty important? Well, turns out it's especially important if you start dangling money in front of that equation and doing a bug bounty. So in the uh, sort of in the uh, time frame 2005 to 2010 and a little beyond, we start seeing bug bounties crop up at a lot of the larger companies. They got, they got used to the coordinated vulnerability disclosure, so now they want to sort of turn on the faucet a little bit more and actually incense people, outside researchers, to come in. Um, so we, at Vericode, we wanted to do an infographic to kind of explain who has bug bounty programs, what, what is a bug bounty program, just, to, just to, to, to publicize things. And we came up with this fun, with fun graphic. And actually, the original graphic did not have Microsoft on it because Microsoft didn't have a bug bounty program until June of 2013. We had created this a couple years earlier. But when Microsoft came out with a bug bounty program, it was such a, a big event because they had held off for so long and they were the largest software company. We updated our infographic. And you can see here in the bottom left there, we put a new um, knight in shining armor, I guess, um, to represent Microsoft. And then promptly we got an email from this lady over here. <laughs> yeah, so since, you know, Microsoft had publicly said that they would never pay for vulnerability information, their executives had gone on the record. Um, you know, and I, of course, was diligently working inside, as only a hacker does, um, changing hearts and minds and trying to create a viable process for Microsoft. Um, when this thing finally launched, you know, it had taken three years of hard-won economic research, game theory research, all of these things, to be able to shape the funnel that was already the biggest funnel in the world for intaking vulnerabilities. 
database, over 200,000 non-spam email messages a year come into Secure at Microsoft. So you can understand why they would have said, please, no more. <laughs> We're good. We don't need to add money to this equation. So I was quite upset that a white man was used to represent what I had created through flesh, bones, and tears. So I sent them an updated graphic that I made myself. And we did update the graphic, of course. Right. <laughs> and what is that graphic, Katie? So I mean, I think I'm a wizard, Harry. But um, here's the thing. You might be confused by the hair color on that, that it doesn't match my current hair color. But you know, the internet's memory is that of a goldfish. I've only had pink hair for three years. That was uh, you know, my natural hair color with a little blue streak in it. And it was an accurate representation of who was really behind the Microsoft bug bounties. Representation matters. I made sure of it. And these guys had a great sense of humor with my, I don't know, really, really bad Photoshop, um, uh, Photoshopping of their infographic. So let's talk about these Microsoft bug bounties. I said it was hard won. Well, you know, years of preparation, all of these studies, going up my chain of command. You know, my chain of command certainly didn't want to handle more than 200,000 email messages a year as it was, right? Um, I think 2008 was the year that popular science called Microsoft security grunt in the top 10 worst jobs in science. We were between like elephant vasectomist and whale feces researcher. We we're right, <laughs> right in there. And it was true, right? So why tempt fate and get, get more bugs, potentially, when we could get all of these bugs for free? High quality bugs, bugs that could go for hundreds of thousands of dollars on the offense market at the time. Well, what you're looking at here is on the left, you see the graph that was the actual slide and the actual data that was used by me to convince the head of Internet Explorer at the time to pay for his own bugs. And what you're seeing there is in the white graph, that is the actual number of bugs we received during the IE10 beta period. And the big old white spike is the spike of submissions we got after the beta period was closed. Now, why would these friendly hackers do this to us? It was kind of the worst time ever to hear about it. Clearly, they were doing research the whole time. But remember, at the time, there were no bug bounties. And so the only thing they could get was a hope at 12-point Arial font and their name in a bulletin, right? That was credit. And so what I said was, look, we can shape the traffic if we put a bug bounty at the beginning of the IE11 beta period. And we projected that we would get the majority of the bugs at the beginning. That maximizes success for everybody. That, and, you know, little bit of money, put their name up in lights on our web page, get it fixed during the beta period, hopefully identify other related issues and fix those too. I mean, it was pretty much win, win, win. And then the customers would have less to patch once the, uh, the actual code was released out of beta. So we got 18 bulletin class vulnerabilities for a total expenditure of about $28,000. So it was a huge success. And what you see on the right is a giant check, because James Forstraw, the recipient of the very first $100,000 mitigation bypass bounty, had told me that he envisioned me surprising him on stage at Blue Hat with a giant check. So we called it James and the Giant Check. And we gave him a giant check on stage, a novelty check, which somehow disappeared afterwards. How do you lose one of those things? But here's the thing. You know, we all work for a, a, a complementary set of motivations, right? It's a blend of motivations. Compensation, recognition, pursuit of intellectual happiness. And the recognition part was actually tied to compensation in a lot of cases, right? Yeah, when uh, we were at At Stake, um, and you know, we're a small consulting company, uh, I had to convince our CEO that having a vulnerability disclosure policy, continuing to do vulnerability research and publish it, even publish it if the vendor you know, didn't respond and didn't fix it, you, know, you can imagine how those conversations went. He's like, what is the benefit? What is the benefit to at stake to do this? So I remember having conversations with our CEO and the thing that really kind of flipped him over the side was the 12 point Arial font. I said, look, and Microsoft on their web page is going to thank a veric uh, uh, I'm going to say Vericode again, an <laughs> at stake researcher with, by name, and it's going to say from at stake. And they're going to recognize that we're contributing to securing Microsoft's customer base. And he said, OK, that, that, that makes sense. That, that, if they're going to give us that recognition, then, then I think that it's acceptable that we do that. And so that 
without that little 12 point font, you know, we probably wouldn't have been able to even do the vulnerability research and release it. You know, it was not just good for business, it was good for recruiting. It meant that if you came to work with us, you could continue your research and get it published. And that we weren't all going to be just doing pen testing under NDA, and that you would never be able to develop your career if you came to work with us. So it was super important. Now, um, Weld is going to talk about another disclosure event that he had the privilege of helping to coordinate. Yes, so um, I was involved with the uh, on the researcher side of the Facebook uh, bug bounty, um, and this time it was actually with another woman, and that woman happened to be my daughter. Um, my daughter was interning at uh, Veracode when she was in college. Um, I think this was about uh, five, five years ago or six years ago, and, uh, and uh, she said, we had these hackathons at Veracode twice a year where people would team up together in groups and write some software, figure something out, maybe do some security testing. And she came to me and said, Dad, let's do one together. And I said, that's a great idea. What do you want to do? She said, let's find a vulnerability in a popular website. <laughs> and I said, OK, that sounds like fun. Uh, and uh, you know, she was actually a, a, a political science major, by the way. She wasn't an engineer. Um, and so she, I said, well, what, what website do you know a lot about? What, what website do you know how to use? You know the functionality? She so said, I know a lot about Facebook. So uh, I had these visions of teaching her how to use a web proxy, showing her how to uh, look at JavaScript and all this. And she just went off on her own and did her own thing. Right? I didn't do, actually do, I got busy and I didn't do any testing. And she came up with the idea that um, there was a recently implemented feature in Facebook where you could block a user, then you wouldn't see that user anymore. They couldn't interact with you. They couldn't post. They couldn't see anything you were doing. And, and uh, she said, well, let's see if they implemented it in all the places that you would, because there's all kinds of little edge cases around user interaction. So she's going through, looking through all the places in uh, Facebook where users interact, and she finds out that after you block a user, they can still send you a message through Facebook Messenger, which seems kind of odd, right? Like, how could they miss that? Um, so we, we reported the bug to the bug bounty program, and they came back and said, well, we did some testing, and we actually found that it takes 24 hours for messages to start to get blocked. So because they eventually get blocked, we don't see this as a bug. Not We're not going to pay you a bounty. Not a have a nice day. Bye-bye. <laughs> and you know, I have a little bit of experience with reporting bugs to big companies. And I said, you know what? I think what you should write back is, if you don't consider it a bug, then you have no problem with us writing a blog post about what we did to find this and the, and the problem that's there. And they came back the next day and said, actually, we're going to fix it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we consider it a bug. Mm -hmm. And my daughter got an $1,100 uh, <laughs> bug bounty out of it, which was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned by doing this, and I have to give kudos to Facebook, not only for actually fixing the bug, but um, they had set up a separate instance of their software where security researchers could look for problems without potentially impacting the live site and the live uh, and the privacy of other users, because a lot of things are going to be authorization problems, right? Think of how complex the authorization is in Facebook. I can't even imagine. But you're going to find you could get, actually get at private data. So their bug bounty program rules say is go ahead and and and, and interact with the the test instance, not the live instance. Um, but Katie's going to tell us why that is, why there is that second instance. How do they come up with this idea? Well, you know, back in 2013, a researcher had submitted a bug where you could post on, you know, another user's page who didn't allow posting from, from non-friends. And uh, basically tried to report it, but there was a little bit of a language barrier issue. And so the triage team there at the time at Facebook closed it and said, you know, sorry, like come back with more information or, or something that, that we can kind of take action on. And that was closed in error, right? 
And so the researcher said, well, I didn't do a good enough job of explaining it. Let me just po post on Mark Zuckerberg's page to show, right? So that happened, and of course they said, ah, yes, that is a bug. But because the terms of their program, and they did not yet have this separate test instance, the terms of their bug bounty program said, well, thank you, but if you violate another user's privacy without their permission, then we're not going to pay a bug bounty. So the internet became outraged um, and crowdfunded this guy. I think it ended up at like 12,000, over $12,000 of a bounty. So with that black eye of uh, triage implementation, um, Facebook decided that, you know what, they do want the bugs, they do want to know about privacy violating bugs, but they don't want to risk anyone zucking it up again, so they decided to make this other instance. Um, and things really, really improved that way. But a lot of organizations don't have that massive capability to throw up another instance and all of that um, and really model and keep in sync two versions. So while that's a great idea, sometimes it's harder to implement. Now, let's talk for a minute about hard to implement bug bounty programs. How many of you have heard of Hack the Pentagon? OK, I hope some of you have heard of Hack the Pentagon. So when I was at Microsoft, um, you know, I was giving talks about the thinking that went into the creation of the Microsoft bug bounty programs, and one of those was a guest lecture I got to do at MIT Sloan School, Harvard Kennedy School, and sitting in that small room was my friend Michael Solmeyer, Sultan of Cyber on Twitter, great Twitter handle, um, but he actually uh, was at the time the director of cybersecurity policy for the office of the Secretary of Defense, and so. That was the first time I was invited to the Pentagon. I was pretty excited. Um, over the years, they had a lot of questions about implementation. How do you take a complex organization that was having trouble keeping up with the vulnerabilities it already knew about and experiment with doing some of this interactive research, coordinated vulnerable disclosure with hackers? When they called me up right before RSA, I think it was about four years ago, they said, good news, <laughs> we're ready to do a bug bounty. And I said, why are you starting with a bug bounty? I just told you, you need to start with vulnerable disclosure. And they said, well, you know, we think it's going to be a really nice way to show off the new digital defense service, you know, and we're being more agile and adopting uh, outside technologies and best practices. So there we had it, hack the Pentagon. So we launched it in April of 2016. And my goodness, have things changed. So I'm going to call your attention to a little bit of data here. One, when we launched it, you know, they were cautious, and they wanted people to pre-register, and they had to be US tax-paying persons. So they could be US citizens or somebody authorized to receive money in the United States. So you had to pre-register if you were interested and give your social security number. Now, you can imagine, there was a lot of paranoia, but what was funny about it was a lot of the hackers were like, I'm not going to give the government my social security number. And I'm like, psst, hey, they gave you that number. I was like, but they don't know my real name. And I'm like, no, nope, that's not how that number works. So anyway, <laughs> but they don't know I'm a hacker. You're tweeting about it right now. So luckily, <laughs> After sending out a few tinfoil hats and reminding hackers that, hey, at least you're good at hacking, um, you know, an overwhelming number of hackers pre-registered. We were hoping for a few hundred. We got over 1,400. But look at the cruelty that we imposed upon ourselves. Uh, number one, never start a bug bounty program at midnight. Do not do. Um, because we received the first vulnerability report at 13 minutes past the hour. Um, also, <laughs> That number of researchers and that target that hadn't really been hit by outsiders before, there were a lot of duplicate reports. Look at the signal to noise, not so good. You know, the number of reports received versus valid bugs, not a great number. So what did we do in the second instance, which was hack the army? Well, one, we didn't just launch hack the army alone, we also launched it at the same time as what I told them to do in the first place, which is the vulnerability disclosure program for all of DOD. And so those launched in November of 2016. Now you notice the numbers, the signal to noise is a lot better. We also started it at noon, civilized. Um, but we capped the number of researchers. And that was basically just to manage the influx of traffic, to not make you know, the DOD triage team's job as bad as whale feces researcher or you know, et cetera. So 
it couldn't have continued, really, without the ongoing coordinated vulnerability disclosure program because people were excited that they were finally able to, if they see something, say something to the United States government. It was previously illegal, and they would have definitely been considered for prosecution, if not actually prosecuted. So what do researchers expect? So now that we talked a little bit about um, bug bounty programs, I want to remind everyone that they're not, they're, there's still a lot of coordinated vulnerability disclosure that's going on that's not part of a bug bounty program. So back to some data here, what are, what are researcher expectations? And if you look down there towards the bottom, um, I expect payment for my services is only 18% of researchers responded with that data. If you look at the top, the things that they said were their um, checked off as their expectations, they're all around making sure that bug gets fixed. That's really the motivation here. So they expect to be told when it's fixed. They expect regular updates um, on, on the correction of the vulnerability, so they kind of want to know, are you working on it or are you just blowing me off? Um, they expect a time frame, right? It's not, they don't want it to take forever. They expect it to be, they found, the, they found the flaw, they want you to fix it and protect your users. Um, this one was surprising. 37% said, I want to be able to validate the fix. So I thought that was quite interesting that there was an expectation that they would be given an opportunity to validate the fix. Over a third said that. Um, and then the other thing that uh, was actually surprising is down there at 16% towards the bottom is I expect recognition. So there wasn't really a lot of, of, of researchers who even wanted the recognition but they all expected it to be fixed in a timely way and to be told and updated about the process. Right, so the most attractive incentives, it turns out, is having a friendly open front door, not threatening legal action, and actually fixing the bug. Amazing, human nature. Shocking. Who'd have thought? So, um, 47% of the participants had actually worked with bug bounties, and that's either on the receiving end or on the, you know, perhaps having to implement a fix um, or actually participating in hacking in bug bounties themselves. Now, while the majority in the survey thought, yes, this is a useful way to leverage, you know, security research and everything, which is great, um, uh, over a third of them didn't have such a rosy experience. So that 26% that tried it didn't like it, didn't meet expectations, right? And that could be on either side of the equation because of the breadth of the security respondents. Um, and 7% really just thought it was a PR exercise. That's the one that I call bug bounty Botox. If you haven't done any of your homework internally and you're just looking to slap a bug bounty out there to say that we take your security very seriously, but you're not actually planning to fix it, well, you're not pretty on the inside. It's bug bounty Botox. So, Knowing about bugs, turns out, is like one one-thousandth of the battle. Nearly half of the organizations had implemented these bug bounty programs, or implemented a bug bounty, but only 19% of the reports came from an actual bug bounty program, a managed program. Um, what's interesting here in terms of the equation is, in open source, who is responsible for fixing the vulnerabilities? Well, it's the maintainers. And in this survey, 63% of open source vulnerabilities reported are not being fixed. Why? Because a lot of the maintainers are overwhelmed. There might be one person working on an incredibly popular package that got really popular and had a vulnerability. OpenSSL was in that category for a long time before Heartbleed. But resources still aren't being poured into that half of the equation. The European Commission said, good news, everyone. We've decided to sponsor bug bounties against the most commonly used open source deployed across the European government. They didn't even tell the maintainers. I contacted the Apache server core guys and was like, hey, the three of you who are paid to do this, did you know about this? And they said, oh, no, thanks for the heads up. They're going to turn on the fire hose. You might want to you know, get ready for it. Yeah, someone painting a bounty bullseye on your back. And well, anyway, I just said, why aren't we actually pouring money into the folks who have to fix it and ideally prevent vulnerabilities in the future? So unbalancing the equation here is a little bit of a problem with this bug bounty fever that we have all been getting into in the last few years. So, so we, we've talked about some horror stories and some problems, but in general, if you look at the survey results, um, we've, we've come a long way. Things are actually in really, really good shape um, than they were 10 years, 15, 20 years ago. 
And so I wanted to show up with some final, final data from the survey, which gives us that, uh, a, a good positive picture. We found out, and, and I was actually surprised how good it was. It, it was three out of four organizations had actually an established CVD. They had something. They had, they, they had a, an address and said, please send vulnerability reports to us. So it was a, it was a small bar to reach. But you know, the fact that three out of four organizations had done that is, is really good news. The other good news is for those in the survey um, who, who dealt with an unsolicited, unsolicited vulnerability disclosure report, 90% 90 90 said it was handled in a coordinated fashion. 90%, that's great. That's even more happening in a coordinated fashion than people who have an established method for receiving vulnerabilities. So that means that the researchers were schooling the organization and say, this is how you do coordinated vulnerability disclosure. So even when the organization didn't have it. So that's a little bit different than it was 22 years ago when we were dealing with Microsoft. So I see this as a huge success. It only took 22 years to get to where we are. So things move slowly. But then the, finally, the one last point I wanted to make here is there's actually a lot of unsolicited vulnerability disclosure going on. If you don't even have a bug bounty program, 37% of organizations said they received something in the last 12 months. So that should tell you that if you don't have a way of receiving um, vulnerabilities from researchers, that you should, you should put one in place. That's, and that's going to be one of my recommendations. Well, it's a 22-year overnight success, right? Exactly. It's totally exactly. working. We did it, Katie. Yeah, oh, all um, right. So, you know, just want to give some takeaways. You know, we gave you a lot of data. We talked about some war stories. You know, what are our recommendations from what we've learned over the years? And the number one thing that you can do really easily next week when you get back to your organization is find out if you have a contact address, does your organization, is your organization able to receive a vulnerability from the outside world and do something, do something with it? But remember, you can't just put up a contact address and a scope page and call it good. That's like saying, you know, my grandmother makes the best lasagna. I'm going to invite everyone in the world over for dinner. She's going to get a little backed up in the kitchen. So making sure that you have a process internally to handle unsolicited bug reports. This is different from your regular vulnerability management process or your pen test vulnerability addressing process that you can address at your own leisure. This is very different. So making sure that you have that digestive system of bugs ensures that you will not go to the bug buffet and get bug indigestion. And then finally, and this will take some time, we highly, highly recommend doing your own security testing as part of your development life cycle before you release it, either using automation or manual testing so that you can actually find and fix these bugs in a much cheaper way than waiting for an external researcher to find them. We still think CVDs are a great idea and bug bounties could be appropriate, but without actually trying to fix the stuff yourself, it's just going to be a more expensive and more time-consuming process. Well, we've shared a lot with you today. We are so grateful that you joined us. Um, and I believe that we'll have some resources and links in the final versions of the slide that are posted. Um, but right now, we've got actually a, a room for a couple of questions. There are two microphones, as I flight attendant you in. There are two microphones on either side. If you have questions, please come to the mics. But otherwise, you know, coordinated vulnerable disclosure as driven by hackers who then became C-level executives. Hopefully, we've done a little bit to help the world become a better place. We've come a long way, baby, but we need your help. Thank you. Thanks so much. Steve, Chrissy, Coley, please raise your hand. This wonderful person right here, inventor of CVE, and you know, co-conspirator, and we can't remember how long we've known each other, but dear friend and ally of Coordinated Vulnerable Disclosure. Please, your question. Hi, thanks. My, my name is Ben Spear. I'm the director of the Elections Infrastructure ISAC that's been established to help protect the uh, election offices, and we're looking at establishing a CVD and, and things like that. I'm sure you guys have seen the ongoing discussion about the recent blockchain voting app and the vulnerability disclosure there. And one of the arguments that they had made uh, as to why they went forth the way they did um, was because they felt that the uh, 
the vendor had previously had a negative response to uh, vulnerability disclosure and that they didn't use the bug bounty program because they didn't feel that uh, they could do the work that they needed to do to address the vulnerabilities they were concerned about within the constraints that were provided by that. Bingo. And so I was wondering your thoughts on that and how that can be addressed or how, how the researcher should behave in that sort of context. Well, you know, I have opinions um, about this. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's interesting because the commercialization of bug bounties and coordinated vulnerable disclosure platforms, you know, we all thought was a great idea, right? Facilitate this process and, and uh, reduce friction between the researcher and, you know, the organization receiving. Um, but unfortunately, because they have a business model and they're kind of selling control, they have these sort of non-disclosure terms. And, you know, Jonathan, who found the Zoom bug last year, encountered this on all the major bug bounty platforms. He said, look, I just want to see the bug fixed within 90 days. It's important to me. I don't even need the bounty. And I don't want to have to go through your platform to, to be able to do it. I will. but." I keep getting these nasty grams from, from the platform managers saying, yeah, but you can't disclose unless they give permission or we'll kick you off the platform. So unfortunately, the commercialization pressures of the bug bounty programs are now driving friction and wedges between security researchers and the organizations that they're supposed to be trying to get to. We don't need any of that. We don't need to regress on this timeline. So yes, I have strong opinions about this. This is why I think that bug bounty should not actually come with non-disclosure, and in fact, Microsoft's original bug bounties had no non-disclosure agreement, meaning we were paying $100,000 on a wink and a handshake. Do you have anything else to add to that one? No, I, I think sometimes you have to go outside of a bug bounty program um, to, because, because of restrictions. Um, and you know, that's just going to be part of the decision-making process that the researcher is going to have to do sometimes. Um, I don't know the exact details of that case, but um, there are definitely going to be times when you're, 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 you're gonna have to release or you're not, gonna, you're not gonna be able to follow the rules of engagement. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Um, we'll take your question when we see you some other time. Thank you all so much and enjoy the last day of RSA. Thank you.